Hey, welcome. I guess this is the evening crowd. Um, tonight I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, composability for cloud native applications. And uh, theme of the talk plays well with others. Um, when I was growing up uh, in school, children were graded, young children were graded on uh, how well they played with other kids in the schoolyard. And, uh, we want to make sure that uh, when they grow up, they're capable of working well with others and uh, in different environments. So uh, we think we've uh, seen a lot of lear lessons learned from the open source uh, Kubernetes project uh, on how to build cloud native applications that work well with others and uh, have greater composability and reuse. So as it matures, we hope to see more of that. And uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm Steve Judkins, and uh, I'm a program manager at Upbound in Seattle. And uh, we love Kubernetes. Uh, you all probably uh, are aware of and love Kubernetes as well, or you wouldn't be here. So um, I'll be talking a bit about um, the benefits of uh, container orchestration uh, for scaling your own uh, software deployments. But that's not um, all that Kubernetes brings to the table. Um, it also makes it easy to use a declarative management API, and um, uh, these active state controllers uh, can reconcile the actual state of your application with the desired state. Um, so this has shown how great it can be for complex apps, and, um, uh, but there's even more. There's, uh, it's extensible. Uh, Kubernetes lets us define custom resource uh, definitions, and uh, Implementing controllers is sort of the right way to extend Kubernetes, so um, we can manage more things within our infrastructure than uh, uh, we have been. So if we take a look at like the modern cloud application, uh, you're probably leveraging Kubernetes in your apps. Uh, it just makes sense to deploy our apps to containers. Um, like many companies, you probably built these apps, uh, you've deployed them to a cluster, just like the big container ship here, when we talk about deploying with Kubernetes, uh, those are running in your own cluster, uh, and you have a responsibility for managing that cluster. So most of us want to take advantage of cloud platforms, and uh, the cloud providers have built these big, beautiful cities with lots of infrastructure. Uh, they have an SLA they can give you. And uh, so in order to take advantage of that, uh, you know, to manage databases. We can then have uh, scalable databases that manage uh, uh, backups, replication, uh, disaster recovery. Uh, there's just a lot of features there that uh, we don't have to manage when, uh, when we're uh, deploying to our own cluster. So, uh, you know, and of course, public cloud providers have been rolling out uh, new features, advanced features at an amazing rate. So. If you want to take advantage of those differentiated services uh, like search, AI, ML, uh, it's kind of a pain to manage those in your own cluster. So kind of what's wrong with the picture? Uh, modern applications are basically composed of more than just the services that we're writing and maintaining. Uh, you're going to have dependencies on databases, uh, object storage and buckets, uh, pub sub, search, monitoring sort of the typical application components. Uh, but do you really want these all running in your cluster? Uh, do you want to be paged at midnight? Um, I don't. So uh, the other a aspect of this is that your IT and DevOps groups are typically running a completely different set of tools uh, for orchestrating or uh, provisioning infrastructure. So that has kind of become this dumpster fire of tools that uh, don't align with all the great Kubernetes uh, work that's been going on. So can we solve this in an elegant way? Um, if we take a moment to look at the different approaches to infrastructure orchestration that are out in the wild, we'll see some patterns. So I kind of find it useful to categorize these uh, components in, uh, in this way. So along the vertical axis, you have uh, your services and those running in your Kubernetes cluster, uh, which you might have deployed with Helm. Uh, you might have basic 
cloud provider services uh, that uh, you're taking advantage of. And um, if you need something like cloud formation, that can cover the gamut of AWS, but doesn't extend to other cloud providers. Uh, at the top of that axis is utilizing different differentiated cloud provider services across multiple uh, cloud providers. And something like Terraform, uh, you know, and HCL allows you to basically do that kind of thing for installation and some upgrade cycles. Uh, on this axis, uh, you have right, the whole resource lifecycle management. Uh, and many of these tools, like Ansible and Chef and Puppet, have gotten you closer to the install and upgrade path. But when we look at CoreOS, you know, who introduced the operator framework, we see what it means to uh, have the entire uh, lifecycle managed within an active state controller. Uh, and there have been some you know, projects like AWS service operators that have taken that into uh, different cloud providers. But nothing has really uh, reached that target of having all of the complex uh, managed services available in cloud providers, uh, across all the cloud providers or managed services, and for the entire life cycle. So how could we solve this in an elegant way? Uh, if it were based on the Kubernetes engine, uh, and it brings those cloud uh, provider services and infrastructure into Kubernetes, uh, gives you one API to manage everything, and provides portability for those workloads that you have beyond containers. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? So uh, if we look back for a, mo a moment, the time feels right for this. Um, we're in kind of an interesting moment in the evolution of cloud native. Um, the level of abstraction has increased over time. Uh, if we go back to virtual machines, you know, OpenStack and AWS EC2 got us into infra as a service and gave us operability and resiliency and elasticity. And uh, when K Kubernetes came along with uh, managed Kubernetes and GKE and EKS, you know, we have containers as a service. So we're now getting into more modularity. And, uh, you know, with, with modularity and, and we saw the evolution of, of lambdas and functions as a service. But I think now we're at a state where we can start to get some of the benefits of portability and modularity out of this. Uh, we have all the pieces in place within Kubernetes to start building what, what I think of as portable resources. And in a workload-centric mo model, uh, those portable resources can be uh, span things that we're writing and, and applications that we have dependencies on. So when we look at building this on the Kubernetes engine, uh, you know, there's lots of advantages and lessons learned in Kubernetes, including a declarative API, which is great, uh, kubectl for uh, native integration with uh, other tools, libraries, and UI, a rich ecosystem and community around this, obviously, and um, letting us apply some of the lessons learned from container orchestration to multi-cloud workloads and resources. So when we look at the resource lifecycle management piece of this, um, Kubernetes has custom resources um, that we can use to model cloud provider services as well. And uh, we can uh, use custom uh, controllers to provision, configure, scale, monitor, upgrade, uh, provide failover and backup. All of those lifecycle management things can be, uh, that logic can be put into a controller and that control can handle active reconciliation so that we essentially hands off, have hands off uh, management of those uh, uh, cloud provider services. Uh, we also have this portable resource abstraction notion. So, uh, you know, uh, Kubernetes has a powerful volume abstraction. It uh, gives portability for stateful applications. Um, but what about other resources? Uh, cloud provider resources might include databases, buckets, clusters, caches, message queues, data pipelines, everything there. So let's abstract those two. 
Um, we really want to get to writing once and running anywhere. And um, how did we do that? So um, uh, so about uh, seven months ago, uh, Upbound introduced Crossplane. Um, it's an open source multi-cloud control plane. And uh, it was uh, released where it's still young. It's uh, version 0 0.2. Um, but what this uh, does is it leverages the uh, Kubernetes API machinery, uh, etcd, the workload scheduler, and uh, introduces resource controllers for both uh, the we support the three uh, cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud. Uh, there are other cloud providers we'd like to extend that support to. And um, it can also provide uh, controllers for actively managing uh, other third-party software. Uh, we'd like to see that extended to things like Elastic, uh, uh, Confluent, Databricks, other typical apps, that, uh, typical frameworks that your app's going to manage. And of course, by building on the Kubernetes API machinery, you have all the same uh, user interfaces and client libraries that uh, you've grown to uh, love and use. And so <laughs> when we look at uh, one of the concepts that we're introducing here uh, to uh, do this is called separation of concerns, where uh, we look at a developer who can compose their app and uh, resources in a general way, think about the dependencies that they have, and at development time, make sure that they're less tightly coupled. And I kind of think of it like this um, image from Todd McLean, who deconstructs common uh, consumer items or household items, um, and you see just how complex some of these uh, simple items have become. But when we think about how we build upon the machinery uh, of software, we have to get to the point where we have a factory model of, of components that we want to reuse and uh, design uh, to be modular and reused in other applications, uh, regardless of where those applications are intended to run. So uh, the separation of concerns also lets an administrator define the environment specifics uh, and policies. So at development time, I might be running this in Minikube and uh, installing cross-plane uh, using cloud resources. But when I go to production, that environment uh, can be maintained um, by an administrator that can set policies. I don't necessarily see secrets. Um, I just need a connection string or uh, you know, the secret references for a database uh, request. So how do we model that? We, we, we looked at um, persistent volume claims and storage class in Kubernetes, and that's a model for uh, creating resource claims and resource classes. So uh, if I have a resource class that is a database, I can make a claim on that as an app developer. And uh, this allows us to do some dynamic on-demand provisioning of resources when we deploy to a specific environment. So if we look at how this uh, enables us to get to a GitOps-style cloud native development pipeline, we're going to have uh, essentially app owners who are developing uh, their YAML uh, for their application that includes resource claims and workloads. Uh, we'll have administrators who are also uh, provisioning the environment uh, or the um, uh, resource classes that are available within that environment. Uh, they'll be um, choosing providers that uh, basically can um, be used for that. They might ch choose to use AWS or GCP. And they'll be defining concrete r resources like secrets um, and uh, VPCs and other things within that environment. So as an app developer, I'm going to be insulated from that. And I think in this way, the, the dev and the ops world converge on a single API, uh, Kubernetes API-based uh, uh, resource for that, uh, that stack or app definition that's composed of those two different things. 
so just to give you an example of what a resource uh, claim uh, would look like as an app owner, um, here's Postgres um, where the request for Postgres it doesn't have a whole lot of environment specifics. I don't yet say where this is going to run. Um, I basically can specify the engine version that I need and that uh, it's going to come from a cloud Postgres provider. The resource class, as defined, uh, there are defaults that are installed when cross-plane is installed, but the system administrator can go in and update those uh, defaults. But this is going to contain properties that are defined that are specific to that cloud provider. Uh, it might, uh, on AD AWS, um, be using a certain instance size or uh, uh, database size. Um, they're going to be able to define policy and uh, allow uh, apps to default to that. So one of the uh, partners we've been extremely fortunate to be working with is GitLab. Uh, we wanted to choose a partner that has a fairly complex real-world application uh, to prove out uh, CrossPlane's model. And uh, we're learning a lot about uh, how to design the controllers and the workloads. So just to give you an example, GitLab is currently deployed. As, it's a Helm chart. It has about 4,800 lines of YAML. It uh, consists of 14 deployments, three jobs, nine services, 16 config maps. Uh, so there's a lot going on in there. Um, their main dependencies are on Postgres, um, Redis, and object storage. So they wanted to have this run across, uh, be able to deploy across different cloud providers. And uh, we were starting to look at their current install and uh, how could we make this better. So with a custom resource definition, there's a simple config experience. With the custom GitLab controller, um, we can generate these artifacts and essentially manage the state of the deployment and get to the point where the deployment of GitLab is a fully automated and portable multi-cloud deployment. So this is how it kind of looks when you uh, look at what we've desi designed for GitLab. Uh, and by the way, this is all out on uh, our open source uh, site, so you can review uh, how this is uh, the examples for this. Uh, you'll see that basically the Postgres uh, controller, Redis controller, and bucket controller are pulled in as resource claims within GitLab. Uh, the, uh, on AWS or GCP or Azure, those are mapped to the different uh, uh, cloud provider-specific services. So it might be buckets on uh, AWS and um, you know, we're going to also be spinning up and deploying to a uh, managed cluster, so it's uh, GKE or AKS or uh, whatever the cloud provider specific um, resource is. So Crossplane just manages this for you. So right now I'll kind of show you a demo that uh, steps through this step by step. It kind of decomposes it, um, the app would normally bundle these things together, but I think this will give you an idea of what it looks like. Switch over. So first we're going to basically install Crossplane. Uh, in this case, it's my local Minikube cluster. Uh, I'm going to run it, um, you know, you might just run it where your workloads are going to run for, for uh, test and staging. Uh, so we grab Crossplane from the master channel. And by the way, I could never type this fast and I don't want to screw up the demo, so it's, it's a video for you. Um, so we'll install the Helm chart um, from uh, our master channel to get Crossplane installed. And um, the key th part of this is once we've installed Crossplane, we will have on our system uh, custom resources for a set of uh, classes. So you can see here when we do a 
kubectl to get those CRDs that we now have um, various uh, CRDs for um, buckets and uh, databases, uh, memory caches, and other things that have been installed and are available from different, uh, all three cloud providers. And once we've installed Crossplane, now we want to basically start uh, to grab our cloud provider uh, credentials. And for this example, we're just going to do uh, the simplest possible thing. We're going to uh, grab our uh, credentials from GCP and uh, stuff them into a YAML file. So here we grab the credentials and uh, just copy them into our provider YAML. So now we have those uh, credentials and we're gonna deploy those to uh, our cluster as secrets. So with the secrets available, we can uh, then provision some resource classes. So the process of uh, provisioning resource classes is really uh, the domain of the administrator. If you're playing administrator and app developer, you can put these two together. But um, an administrator in this case might decide they're going to make available um, the resource classes for AWS only if you're uh, an AWS shop. And um, so you can go in and set various properties within this. Um, in this case, let me go back there, we were setting the, um, the uh, storage size and uh, region for our, um, for our storage for the um, uh, standard Cloud SQL instance in, in GCP. Um, but we can come in and, and basically configure these defaults. In this case, that was the Postgres configuration. Um, also look at the bucket configuration here and just make sure that it's good to go before I uh, start having apps unleashed into our buckets. So once that's set up, uh, I now basically can kubectl create on those uh, resource classes. Those are now created and they're essentially provisioned in that cross-plane instance and available to any apps that want to consume them. So now we go back to what does the app developer do? In this case, uh, we're going to provision some managed services in Google Cloud and then I'll show you in AWS. So uh, this is this is the uh, dependencies for, for GitLab. We basically make use of Kubernetes. Uh, so we're gonna spin up a cluster that we're gonna deploy GitLab to. We're gonna uh, make an instant reference to Postgres and Redis. And um, so what we did was basically uh, deploy the buckets. They uh, have about nine different buckets that they use. Uh, since we basically kubectl applied the bucket resource, um, we now basically have that uh, controller going out and spinning up the buckets in GCP, and once those are reconciled, they'll be bound within the, the resource. So you can kind of see that there. Right now, only one of the buckets is bound, but the others are still being created. So if we switch over and look, uh, we can just keep pulling this, or you can go get a coffee and just wait. The buckets are fast. Um, other th things might take a few minutes, and but now you've got a reconciler that's just doing that work for you. It's uh, hands off. So here I kind of just switch through the console and kind of look and see what the state of things is, um, making sure that uh, things are spinning up. Um, but really, I don't have to do this. It's just to show you. And um, so once those uh, resources are created uh, and uh, bound within uh, Kubernetes, 
we can basically then come and take those resource claims that we have and export them to our uh, GitLab Helm chart. Uh, this, these two steps would generally be bundled together in your application, but we're showing them here so that you can kind of see what's going on under the covers. So here we basically have uh, the GitLab resource claims that we made in our um, default namespace. We're going to copy those to our target cluster and uh, make sure that they're available in the GitLab namespace. And then we're going to update the Helm chart. Make sure we have a values file that has all of our secrets and uh, uh, is, or references to our secrets and is ready to go. So there we go. Um, we've copied over everything into the target cluster. that uh, is ready to go. So now if we grab the Helm chart and uh, everything from the GitLab repo, we are basically ready to install and update it with our values. So that's it. Now we, uh, we're ready to install GitLab. So this essentially will be installing GitLab to our target cluster that we provisioned as a resource uh, claim. And uh, we go ahead and run that. GitLab uh, takes a little while to spin up. So we can either go get coffee again or we can basically watch as it spins these services up. So now we're waiting for, um, we're using Kubernetes, of course, to uh, check the status of uh, whether these services are bound. And you can see here uh, the services that are being initialized, um, including the buckets and Postgres. So once those are spun up, we will have uh, an address, an IP address that we can grab. Um, Crossplane doesn't yet uh, provision the things like VPCs and other uh, uh, open ports and other things like that. We'd like to extend it to manage those things. Uh, so you'll see here that I just grabbed the IP address and manually open that up. Drop that in and create a new DNS entry in uh, Google. And keep waiting here, and we'll see what the state of our pod is. You now see that the status is running or completed on everything um, except for their test thing. So we are basically ready to go. We can then uh, grab the status URL from the uh, controller and basically fire up the console and we are ready to go. So basically that took a complex app and made it hands off with the GitLab uh, controller to handle all of that reconciliation. And that controller can also you know, continue to monitor the uh, health and status of that GitLab deployment. So that is GitLab. Uh, With uh, Crossplane is, uh, uh, oops, excuse me. So uh, we'd love to welcome the community to continue to grow Crossplane. We're just about to hit uh, a dot three release, and uh, but the, we'd love to see uh, folks get involved. I put some resources up here if you want to take a look at uh, the GitLab deployment and other sample applications like WordPress on the site. Um, we have uh, regular community meetings and uh, uh, would love to extend Crossplane into uh, infrastructure provisioning and other cloud providers. So, thank you. Um, anybody else, uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, thanks everybody. 
Do you have a question? Yeah. First of all, uh, I'm a newbie to the, about the containers and Kubernetes. So my question is might be a ridiculous one, but uh, um, what is the, the, the uh, biggest advantage of uh, introducing uh, much cloud, uh, uh, introducing your product? Um, I mean, is it correct understanding that the by using your product, uh, the application code portability is guaranteed, right? Right, right. So one advantage being, you know, all different sides of your house, your administration and, and uh, developers are converging on Kubernetes, but also the application things that you're deploying may not live in a cluster. They may be managing things across clouds. So your application spans that with a single development framework. Uh, most, most applications today are essentially targeting a cluster or they're doing multi-cluster deployments, but it's still limited to your cluster. Yeah. Uh, are there any activities to, to, to uh, minimize uh, such gaps or uh, products like uh, your product uh, activity uh, provided by you is recommended for the future. I think that there are two uh, alternatives uh, in the future, uh, like uh, from application developer point of view, uh, if there is no gap between two clouds, uh, with regard to the application programming point of view, no problem. Uh, so I think there is a way to minimize such gaps, but uh, is there uh, any activities to minimize gap or there's no activities? Well, I think, you know, uh, if I understand your question, the, there are going to continue to be uh, differences across cloud providers. Um, the, they're creating walled gardens, and their incentive is to have differentiated services. But for many of the services, like uh, particularly uh, services that have been taken from open source and, you know, put into the walled garden, like uh, databases, you have... Uh, compatibility at a wire protocol level, like if I want Postgres, you know, it doesn't really matter that it's RDS. So taking those and, and creating a portable abstraction for requesting a SQL database and, and allowing apps to essentially, for the 80% scenario, use portable abstractions uh, before you get into cloud provider specifics uh, is a great way to uh, essentially reduce the development time, right, and give people uh, a, a common set of controllers that are well tested and, and very rich in their active state management. You can certainly go and develop uh, a controller that is specific to a cloud provider and has all of the rich features. Uh, and, and so the breadth and the ability to sort of configure uh, specific features is there. So. Okay, thank you. I understand. Right, thank you. Um, I think we're out of time. Yep. Oh, one, one question? Okay. Coming from, uh, coming from that question, I thought there is some uh, service provider controller that has been developed. So it's an interface been developed for each uh, service provider, cloud service provider. Is that, isn't that helping to alleviate some of the issue with the compatibility? Right, so we do have uh, resource classes for AWS, uh, Google Cloud, and, and Azure, and, um, and so there is um, support directly for, for those. Uh, it doesn't extend to the full breadth of um, APIs, um, and that would be something that we would uh, continue to evolve as cross-plane matures. Oh. Okay, thank you. Cool. Thank you very much.